I agree with the principles that were, were laid out, and I do agree that we are on an unsustainable fiscal path. And that can be defined, though, in a couple of ways. One, of course, is the, the deficit and the, and the debt. Um, I laid out a plan myself where we can reach uh, primary budget balance by 2015. But the other way, I think, that we can measure unsustainability is the growing disparity in income in the United States of America, which I think is equally a problem that we face, a problem for our democracy as well as our economy. And I don't feel that this proposal addresses these dual problems of debt and inequality in the, in the proper way. Um, when I, I agree with uh, Alice Rivlin that we need to have much more significant investment right now. When we get our economy moving, we are also decreasing the deficit. There will be more people working, there will be more people buying, and I think there's somewhat of a different perception of what really does spur economic growth. To me, it is the question of demand, having money in people's pockets, jobs that they have, and unemployment insurance benefits that will make sure that they can go out and actually be customers, spend money, that that's what will drive expansion of business and small business and, and large as, as well. But the top 1% of Americans owns 34% of America's private net worth right now. Um, and the bottom 90% owns just 29%. That means that the top 1% controlled 24% of Americans in, uh, America's income in 2007. Um, it was 34% uh, now and 24% in 2007. So we are seeing a rapid expansion of growth among the wealthy, a transfer of wealth to those at the, uh, at the top. The top 10% controls more than 70% of America's total net worth in this, in this country. Only one in five working Americans enjoy guaranteed pension benefits. Those uh, young people who are worried about Social Security being there shouldn't, but they should worry that they're going to have some sort of pension. Those are rapidly disappearing, meaning there will be more focus, more need for robust Social Security, Social Security security in the, uh, in, in the future. We talk about shared sacrifice. I think these numbers indicate that sacrifice, in fact, has not been shared. That some people have lost and others have significantly gained over the last several years. So we're not starting at the same point when we say we need to share the sacrifice. Among those who are, uh, we, we have right now more than 37 million Americans, including 13 million children living in poverty, and most of those poor people have jobs. So these are working poor in the United States of America. The elderly, who I've said before, have an average income, including everything, private pensions and investments and savings of $18,000 a year. To say that we're going to reduce our deficit and our debt by asking Medicare beneficiaries to pay more for their health care, I think is absolutely unconscionable. To have more money come out of the already 30% of their out-of-pocket income going to health care costs, I think is absolutely the wrong way to go when we do have other options. I put on the table not as a uh, if all else fails, but a, a public option to reduce health care costs. I said Medicare should negotiate for lower prescription drug prices, just as the Veterans Administration does, meaning that drugs are a fraction of the cost. 
when, um, the, uh, over what Medicare beneficiaries pay. There is very little control here of these expanding costs, I think as Senator Durbin pointed out, in the private sector. Social Security, let's underscore that you agree, the co-chairs agree and I agree, are not part of the deficit problem and are not being considered for paying down the long-term debt, that we're looking for solvency. But the chief actuary of Social Security has pointed out that the combination of the proposals that you've made mean that someone who makes $43,000 over their lifetime, depending on when they retire, can lose more than 20% of the benefits that, that they would get under the current Social Security formulas. The changing the cost of living adjustment for the elderly, recalculating the COLA, means a significant cut in benefits because the elderly's in, uh, expenses are skewed in a different way than the rest of the population, more toward health care. So I proposed a different way of achieving 75-year solvency that doesn't hurt the elderly. When we talk about cuts in discretionary spending, although you don't totally spell them out, and also cap how much comes from revenue, which I think is an arbitrary, and I, I, I really don't understand why we do that as the debt commission, as a fiscal responsibility commission, but means, I think, inevitably, that we're going to see programs cut that help to address the problem of those people who have not been part of the party that the wealthiest Americans have benefited from over the years. And so I, I cannot, for the, the reasons of, uh, of equity, of our democracy, of our fiscal path in terms of real live people, support this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I want to thank you for presenting an alternative plan, which you do support, which does uh, address this, you know, crisis, because you realize it's, it's a crisis we have to address. So thank you very much for your constructive Indeed. approach. Indeed.